Welcome to Global Information Security Society for the Professional of Pakistan. Okay guys, so I see there are 14, 15, 15 participants now. Uh, welcome everybody. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Today is April the 20th and we'll start over a third domain of our CSSP. I hope so far everybody is having some good time with this training. And uh, inshallah, we're going to have a uh, good session today also. So this is going to be the third domain uh, of uh, eight. So this is the security architecture and uh, engineering. Uh, we'll do the part one today. And uh, going forward, uh, this is my introduction here. <coughs> um, so you're always encouraged to go to our YouTube channel. This is the link here. You can also search the ISPP on the YouTube and you will get the channel over there. You will see very exciting content and it's uh, increasing, ever increasing. And uh, inshallah, we'll have more things to add. So as you know, we have already started our CISA training uh, also. So there was the uh, domain one was done today a bit earlier. So that will also be added to the YouTube channel. For the CSSP, uh, you should all you, you should all you can also see your introductory session as well as the sessions related to the first two domains so we'll move to this outline of our cbks uh, as you can see that we have uh, eight domains and we have done domain one and domain two which is around 25 percent of the overall coverage of the uh, material for the whole exam and today we'll start our third domain which is the security architecture and engineering which is around 13 percent of the total exam which means around 13 to 20 questions will be with you depending on the number of questions that are shown to you in the exam uh, as you can see that these are the objectives and this is a bit lengthy so we'll start from 3.1 up to 3.8 today we'll cover and in the next session we'll do 3.9 10 and 11 so uh, just to give you the overall idea about this particular domain so this is uh, regarding the overall architecture of the computing system computing environments that you have and also the uh, different kinds of security models different kinds of systems that you can implement and uh, then uh, we'll also see the uh, cryptography how we can implement cryptography which is uh, um, one of the lengthiest part of this module in the old uh, old outline of the CSSP exam cryptography was a complete module uh, at that time but now it has been merged into this domain uh, so we will cover today these uh, the introduction introduction to the computing introduction to the computers and the different parts of the computer and what are the different kind of security architectures which are in place then we'll see how we can assess and mitigate the vulnerabilities in different kinds of systems and uh, that's all for today so let's jump into the content uh, so first of all let's uh, start about this uh, secure design and engineering objectives uh, so as you can understand whenever we are doing the security it is not only computing but computing is the main part of the information security because computers are used for storing using exchanging the information between the different people so you have to ensure that all the security principles of this uh, of, of any data control at any data management are kept into the right perspective whenever you are implementing any security environment so for that for that matter so in this particular domain we have to emphasize on on the architecture of this uh, of our systems from the basics so whenever you are implementing any computing environment you have to ensure that the security is in place from the very beginning so uh, it's not that uh, security should be treated as an add-on to be added later whenever in, in, in any environment where the security is used as an add-on you will see there are failures there are obstacles there are issues and there are unforeseen problems that you can always uh, uh, you can always observe them and you, you will see that they are then later on hard to handle but whenever there is any uh, embedded security in the uh, in any system from its inception you will see that those systems are much better in terms of security and manageability as well as the security in those systems are pretty mature compared to the systems which adopt security later on so uh, in a nutshell what we require is uh, whenever you are implementing any security 
a, a security uh, framework into any environment you have to start from the very beginning and uh, so uh, so that's uh, that's the starting point so <clears throat> Uh, but first of all, let's talk about the computers. So this is uh, computers one of one session. Uh, I will try to just skim through the things because I, I believe all the people who are participating into this training, they are aware of all of these things from the very beginning. So I will just give you a very, very high level brief on these things. So first of all, let's talk about the computing environment. In computing environment, you have a computer system. So in the computer system, you have different components which can be used to form the compute, compute computer. So namely, there are processors, storage, then there are peripherals, then there are operating systems. So the purpose for this is just to give you an introduction of about these components. So let's talk about the processes first or the CPU. CPU is the central processing unit. It's the brain of the computing environment and this is required to run any computers. So this is where all the processing is done. So all the instructions which the computers are getting through any input devices, they are sent to the uh, CPU or the central processes unit and which then uh, which then does the processing on that and provides the output which you use which you, you, which you obtain using the output devices like monitors or printers or any other devices that you have. So within the CPU, there are further two partitions. There is the uh, control unit as well as the ALU or arithmetic and logic unit. So the control unit is the brain of the CPU itself. It controls all the incoming requests and it does the queuing for that. It does the uh, assignment of those requests to the specific registers, storing them and then forwarding them and then maintain, maintaining the overall health and queue of the computing uh, central processor is the purpose of this control unit. And the ALU is the um, arithmetical and logic unit, so which is responsible for doing all the computing and arithmetic logical operations. So whenever you are doing any mathematical operations like plus, minus, divide, etc., they are all done in the ALU. And then uh, to control and all of uh, to maintain all of this data, the memory is used. So whenever the CPU receives any information, it is stored in the registers, which are called the memory registers. So they are used to uh, hold the instructions and also the data to be processed. So it can also have the input uh, data in it, can also have the output data and it also can have some intermediate data. So second part, uh, uh, within the processor, you can have different terms used, multitasking, multiprocessing and multithreading. So these are the different terms used in any computing environment. Uh, multitasking means that the processor can handle multiple tasks. What's a task in a nutshell? The task is any a request sent to the processor to process is the task. So you can say that uh, you, you want to have a, a specific uh, calculation. You, you want to say that you're asking the computer what is two plus five. So that's the task. So which the so multitasking means that this, uh, depending on the type and uh, performance of the CPU, it can handle multiple tasks simultaneously. Simultaneously, it can handle different tasks coming from many different input systems and it can handle them. And uh, for example, you can, in a normal computer, you can run Windows, uh, within the Windows environment, you can run Word, you can run Excel, you can run Internet Explorer, etc. So they're all treated as tasks and within those tasks, there will be multiple threads and those threads are then sent uh, to the CPU to handle and the output is given back to them. Uh, in the multiprocessing, you can have within the same computers, now you can have multiple processors. Initially, when the computing started, so there was a concept of single processor only. Now there are, now you can see that the computers, especially the higher end computers and the servers, so they come with the multiprocessors installed within the computing environment. So uh, you can say that within the same server, you, you can have a motherboard. On that motherboard, you can have multiple sockets. Each socket is treated as a single processor. Then within that processor, you can have uh, multiple cores, so which are which is the logical partitioning, uh, physical partitioning within the uh, within the CPU. So then those cores are then you can see they are uh, like two cores, four cores, eight cores. Now these days even sixteen core CPUs are also available. Each core is a complete processor in itself, and it can handle all the incoming tasks, and it can then queue them and use it. Uh, it can be treated as a single processor in uh, as a standalone environment. So when you do the multiprocessing, it means that multiple processors are there in the system, and they can they are all running simultaneously. They can receive requests from different uh, in, incoming feeds, and they can process them and send the output for that.
And then there are two different terms for that symmetric multiprocessing and asymmetric multiprocessing. In symmetric multiprocessing, all the processors are handling the loads equally. So at any time, any given time, all processors will be having almost uh, equal amount of load with each other. So they will distribute e equally. This is the per uh, it's the uh, it's it's the task of the operating system to ensure that all the processors are equally loaded so if at any time you will see the performance you will see for example if there are two processors you will see both of them running at 40 percent or 60 percent etc but in asymmetric multiprocessing so if there is generally this is done in the environment where you require specific affinity with the processors so in those environments you will see one processor is overloaded compared to the other processor you might see one processor is on 80 percent usage and the other one is maybe on 10 or 20 percent so that also is a function which the operating system does so it depends on the implementation of the handling of the processors how the systems how the operating systems are handling those processors simultaneously so other components of any computing environment are memory and storage so memory and storage in uh, in general they can be they can be classified as one but in general we see them to, uh, as two different things memory is your uh, memory of the computer which is uh, used to uh, to, to store the data which is uh, which is in use right now so when system architecture focuses heavily on memory and how memory is managed because without the memory management your system can be prone to uh, many different kinds of attacks so if you if your operating system and your applications they are not handling the memories very well you will see a lot of issues so the issues can be either in terms of performance or in terms of security performance wise the issues can be that if the memories are not properly handled you will see that some applications are using the memory and then not freeing, freeing it up at the time of closure of that application in that case you will see that the memory leak is happening in that case after a few uh, hours or a couple of days you will see that the some of the memory is uh, used by ghost applications which are not running but they are still reserving that memory and you will see the performance of your system is degrading and the other problem could be the if, if your applications and your operating system is not referencing the memory properly you can have different kinds of issues with the memory mapping so that can also bring your system into in, in, into an unstable environment un, unstable condition which can either crash the system or it can leak information which is there so valuable critical information assets are stored in memory and sensitive programs are executed from memory so it makes that uh, the memory is uh, very important extremely important in any uh, security architecture so let's see different types of memories first of all uh, so first of all you will see there is primary storage which is called also called the memory also other in other words we call it a ram so data waiting for processing by the processors uh, sits in the area called the primary storage. So whenever you have a SKU which is going to the processor, so this SKU uh, contains all the uh, number of requests which is uh, going to be sent to the processor for processing. So it is stored in the primary storage. So it is implemented such as cache or registers, uh, which is also a part of the uh, CPU. So we'll see this in the next slide. And primary storage stores data that has high probability of use being requested by the CPU. So it goes into the CPU queue uh, based on the priority. So it needs to be faster and long then long term and secondary storage, which is why you will see that these caches and the uh, level one and level two caches or the the cache which is part of the CPU is very very high in terms high pro, high speed and in it has a very good response time comparatively. Okay, uh, so here we have another definition here, memory address. So memory address means that in any memory, you will have multiple registers. Each register contains a specific amount of data. So whenever your amount of data, any amount of data is stored in the memory, the operating system uh, maintains uh, a register where the, uh, uh, the, the type of data and the data written to which memory address is, is, is written and uh, that is referred to as the memory address. So whenever that particular application requests that memory back, so that particular register is summoned and from there the, the, the information is fetched and sent back to the application or sent it to the processor for the further processing. So these are the examples for the memory storage, like this is RAM. So RAM is uh, basically volatile. It means that uh, whenever you have a system shutdown, all the contents of the RAM are flushed. 
but uh, now the recent research has shown that even when the system is shut, so there are some traces still available in the RAM because of the uh, the the current which was there in the RAM uh, RAM registers, and from there, somehow some some part or all part of the RAM can be retrieved by specific and very sophisticated tools. But in general, RAM is volatile. So whatever is there is only up to the time until there is power in the system. The moment the power is gone, the contents of the RAM are flushed. The RAM can come in different types. So you have SD RAM, you have EP ROM, SD RAM is, or S, uh, uh, SD RAM is synchronous dynamic RAM. Uh, synchronous means it synchronizes itself with the uh, with the speed of the CPU and with that uh, with, because it is synchronous with the CPU so the amount of data sent is equal to the amount of data received and the the, the speed of data transmit is the same which is why uh, the synchronous data RAM is always dynamic RAM is always uh, faster than the uh, simple dynamic RAM RAMs. So then the other uh, type of memory is the ROM, read-only memory. Uh, it is a non-volatile storage, which means that if uh, the system recycles its power, the content of the ROM are there. So you can say that the uh, the general generally the post process of this computing is stored in the ROM or the initial instructions of the computing power, computing environment to start up, they are all stored in the ROM. So uh, then uh, uh, there is cache memory. Cache memory is part of the CPU or it is next to the CPU. So which contains some very high speed memory, which is used to store the data which is going to be processed or which is processed and then you know, it is going to be sent back to the applications. Uh, so I'm not going into further details because I understand all of you guys are even, even much well versed with these things. Then there is another kind of storage is called the secondary storage. Secondary storage is your uh, storage which you use, to, uh, use generally for storing the data for long term. So this could be your hard disks, this could be your flash drives, which could be your CD drives, CD-ROM, or DVD-ROM, etc. So they are all secondary storages. So uh, they are also non-volatile. It means if when the power is not there, the data stays, and until uh, you until the media is damaged or until you delete the data from there, the data will stay within that. So the uh, used when data must be uh, stored for an extended period of time using high capacity and non-volatile storage. So generally, the speed of the secondary storage is not as much as the primary storage, and the uh, and but the uh, amount of data that you can store in the secondary storage is much higher than the primary storage. So computing systems use multiple media types for storing information. Like so, so there are many different kinds and different types of storage. So now you can see you have 7200 RPM disks, uh, 10,000 RPM disks, 15,000 RPM disks. Then you have the SSDs. Then there are many different kinds of SSDs available. Then there are uh, USB drives. So then they are coming with the uh, USB 2, USB 3, etc. So all of them they differ in terms of speed, in terms of performance, as well as their uh, reliance, as well as their capacity. So uh, depending on the environment, you have to ensure that the uh, the secondary storage system that you are using for the for any system, uh, this is uh, according to the requirements and according to the budget that you have. So there's another concept of uh, which is called the virtual memory. So it is uh, uh, the mem when, when your primary storage is not sufficient to hold all the data that is going to be processed. Some part of the secondary storage is used to put that, that data. So that is called the virtual memory. So you can also call this as the paging file or also sometimes called the uh, so the paging, paging file is a general concept. Uh, so paging file is part of your secondary storage, such as the disks, and uh, in that uh, your data is stored whenever your primary storage is full, and which is why the data which is uh, used at this moment in the RAM, that will be always in the primary storage. If some data in the RAM is not going to be used for some time, and still there is a requirement to use the RAM, so that some of the data will be sent to the virtual memory, and then that RAM will be freed up and used for the currently running applications. When that application comes back, and uh, you want to use that application at that time, it will be it will be retrieved from the virtual memory and again loaded into the primary memory, and from there it will be used. Now the, the the purpose of this is that you have to have a mapping of the virtual memory. So where this where which part of the content is stored in the virtual memory, and how it is going to be returned back to the primary memory. Okay, so 
this is called the now we will see a few of the terms here which are related to the uh, security of the components of the memory so first of all there is memory mapping so memory mapping as i mentioned earlier so cpu ensures that the data which is stored on the memory so it is called the registers so those registers are all listed in the uh, in the specific areas and they are to ensure that the data specific to certain applications that it can only relate to each other so the problem could happen that if your operating system is not in a stable condition or there is an attack so the memory mapping could be mixed so if the data is stored in one uh, part of the memory and uh, uh, there is a virus in the in the memory or there is some other system which is uh, which is not secure and it tries to access that data which is intended for the other system it's the responsibility of the operating system to make sure that those data do, do not go inside with other with, with each other and the data is accessed only by the applications which have stored them for that specific purpose so uh, whenever there is a system which is secure and which is uh, which is stable you will see the memory mapping is in working in a perfect condition and there is no problem with that so the other issue is the buffer overflow buffer overflow happens when you try to store more data in the memory than its capacity so if you have a register which can handle 10 bytes and you are going to store within that 15 bytes so those five bytes which are not going to be stored there so they will be called as a buffer overflow so if you are not uh, if your operating system or your application is not having proper controls on the memory management so you will see the buffer 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 overflow issues happening so this can generally happen when you are declaring the variables and in the variable the length of the variable is smaller and the type the amount of data to be stored in that variable is more you will always see this buffer, buffer overflow so the, the solution for this is that you have to always make sure that whenever you are passing any variables or you are requesting any information from anyone you do the validation make sure that before the data is sent for writing it is uh, checked for the validity whether the size of the data is equal or less than the amount which is accepted by this certain amount of memory register or memory uh, area where you are going to store that so the last part is the memory leak as i mentioned earlier if the application does not free up the memory after it is done the memory leak happens so this is generally done uh, if, the, uh, if the application is closing without uh, without uh, freeing up all the memory now again there are controls within the operating system so which will make sure that if a mem if an application is closed all the memory associated with that particular application is going to be is going to be flushed away uh, and uh, uh, that's how it will be done so the next part is the operating systems uh, so as we talked about the hardware now we come to the software part so operating system is the software that controls the operation of the computer from the moment it turns on or it is booted so it means that the operating system controls the behavior of the hardware so if the hardware is uh, uh, if the hardware is not properly controlled so this can give you unforeseen kind of problems so the operating system's purpose is to ensure that the hardware or the pieces of hardware the different components of your computer they work with each other without any issues and they give you the results which are uh, properly required which are given to you so so you can have a single user environment or multi-user environment in single user environment only one user can work at a time and in a multi-user system the pretty uh, the os will manage the user access to the processor and peripherals and schedule jobs so these are a few examples windows apple mac uh, and unix linux etc so there are different kinds of system then there is another kind of operating system is called also called the network operating system so we which can work in a network and where multiple computers work together and they give you the required result by working together in the single environment okay now how how do you ensure that the access to the hardware is properly managed so um, for any computer to work in a secure and stable way, uh, you have to ensure that the access to the hardware is limited to the specific areas only or specific processes only. So that is done by implementing the 
privilege rings. So privilege ring is kind of uh, a trust level in that you will say that certain applications or processes running in those rings, so they will have access to the hardware. Other processes, they will not be given direct access to the hardware, so they have to go through the trusted or uh, trusted abstraction layer before they can have access to the hardware. So this can only be done uh, by implementing the uh, uh, privilege rings or protection rings. So, so there are generally uh, most privilege rings are in the middle and uh, the outer you go then the privilege starts uh, decreasing and the outer ones they are called the user rings and so they can uh, or the highest number of rings so they will be there so this is an example here so if you can see that there is you, we have implemented it as ring 0 ring 1 ring 2 and ring 3 so ring 0 is uh, the operating system kernel which is the uh, which is the brain of the computer which loads the operating system by itself and it has access to everything and then on ring one you have operating system so ring zero and ring one so they are the uh, higher level of of uh, access so they are the more privileged rings and uh, the these two rings uh, ring zero and ring one they have access to the hardware directly so they can access the cpu they can access the memory they can access the peripherals and they can have ex different kind of uh, direct access to all the uh, computing environment that it is attached to then you go outer then you have ring 2 and ring 3 ring 2 is further uh, which is uh, which handles which has for example the file system drivers or operating system utilities or the drive device drivers so they are all running in ring 2 and then ring 3 they are the user applications that you can see so generally whenever you have any user application running in your environment and it tries to have access to the hardware it has to go through ring 2 3 ring 1 and then ring 0 and from there it will have access to the hardware Okay. So for that special gears between rings are provided to allow the outer ring to access the inner rings resources in a predefined manner. So we have another concept called trusted computer base. So a TCB. So it's a sum of all the protection mechanisms within the computer. So they are all called, they will all be called as the TCB. So TCB's idea was to ensure to, that the computer uh, the computer has a complete secure environment in which all the access to any hardware any software any reserved area is uh, is trusted and it is controlled and it is managed through a proper system so that is the trusting computer trusted computer base so it's, it's a physical implementation so it's responsible for enforcing the security policy of the computer so this policy is not the same policy as, as we talked about in the domain one the security policy is the policy of the computing system in general it means that how the system access will be provided to different peripherals different hardware levels and different components of the system so that is the security policy of the computer so it is the responsibility of the tcb to enforce the security policy so it includes the hardware, software controls and processes. So this is the combination of all of them. So the TCB is responsible for confidentiality and integrity. Okay, so to ensure the confidentiality and integrity, TCB is used. But so TCB is the only portion of the system that operates at a higher level of trust. So which is the level zero and level one of the rings that we saw in the previous slide. So if a computing system contains TCB, uh, then it is called the trusted computing system. So uh, the next concept is the reference monitor. Reference monitor. So reference monitor follows the uh, the TCB follows the reference monitor concept. So as we can say that the TCB was a physical implementation. The reference monitor is the conceptual model. So this is the concept which is implemented using the TCB. So it's an abstract machine that is used to implement security. So the reference monitor's job is to validate access to the objects by authorized subjects only. So here we are taking these two terms here, subjects and objects. Subjects are generally the persons or resources or users or, uh, or computers, uh, different applications. So they are requiring access and objects are the things on which the access is granted for example your files your folders your printer and other systems so they will all be called the objects so uh, the uh, the reference monitor's purpose is to ensure that the subjects and objects they are properly matched and the objects are given author authorized access only for the specific subjects the reference monitor operates at the boundary between the trusted and the untrusted realm and uh, this boundary is known as the security perimeter. So you can say that anything going through the security perimeter, so it has to go through the reference monitor concept. It has to uh, 
to put go through different kind of validation processes once the validation is done only then the access is granted so generally this is granted through implementing uh, different kinds of device drivers different kinds of other applications which is, which are working at a higher trust and then so the reference uh, monitor has these three properties so first of all it cannot be bypassed and controls all access number two it uh, cannot be altered and is protected from modifications or change and number three it can be verified and tested to be correct so these are the three properties of any reference monitor so reference monitor is a conceptual thing and tcb is the physical implementation of that uh, reference monitor okay, so the next concept is this security kernel the security kernel is the implement it implements the reference monitor which handles all user and application requests for access to the system so you can always see here on the right you have the uh, the diagram showing that so you have ring 0 1 2 and 3 and then there is uh, a, uh, operating system executive running and there under that you have kernel and device drivers and then there is hardware abstraction layer which gives access to the hardware through the abstraction layer and then you have in the bottom you will see there are dlls and through which your user applications they access the all uh, secured all, all of these hardware different things so linux and windows uh, they have fairly large security kernels so in general concept the security kernel should be as small as possible so the bigger the security kernel the, the lesser secure it will be it's a general concept but in some some environments you can say that to, to increase security you have to compromise on this um, so if you need to have more security, you can increase it, but it shouldn't be as big as a normal operating system. So in general, the security kernel is very small in size. So this concludes our first part. I think our time is running up. Uh, I will, uh, within one minute, we will have a disconnection and we'll please connect to the same one. So now we'll see a few security models concept. So first of all, let's talk about information security models. So whenever you are implementing any system, you will have to follow one of these security models. Some of these classic examples are this, Bella Pagula, Biba, Clark Wilson, Brewer Nash, and Graham Janik. So we'll go through all of them one by one in the coming slides. The purpose for any, for any information security model is to ensure that the system is providing security using certain rules, and those rules are provided by these security models. So we'll see them one by one now. And I think we are disconnecting now. Okay, welcome back and uh, we'll continue. Okay, <clears throat> so we have now these security models. So first of all, let's talk about the Bella Pajula model. Uh, Bella Pajula is a state machine model so it is for access control and it is related for confidentiality so it works only for confidentiality so uh, the purpose for this bella pajula model is that uh, the uh, subjects should not have access to the uh, to the objects which are at a higher confidentiality level so if you are cleared let's suppose uh, let's let's take an example so we have uh, uh, a model with the security clearances of let's suppose level one level two level three etc so if somebody is cleared for level one he should not have access to the the state the documents or these or the applications which are at level two similarly if you are cleared for level two you should not have access to level three and so on but if you are at level two you can have level Two as well as level one if you are at level three you can have level three plus level two plus level one so this is the confidentiality concept here so it means that the people uh, or the subjects at a certain security level or security confidentiality level they should not have access to the objects at a higher confidentiality level so uh, it it implements this by using these three properties it has these three properties simple start property and start property and the strong start property so simple start property states that you can implement in any of these three properties 
So it states that the subjects cannot read objects of higher sensitivity. SAR property means that the subjects cannot write to objects of lower sensitivity. And strong star means subjects cannot read or write to object of higher or lower sensitivity. Uh, let's uh, see how it works. So this is how it's illustrated. So if, let's start from the left one. So our first first uh, one is for read. If you see here, we have uh, a subject called Alfred and he is cleared for level secret. And uh, now you can see that there are three levels of clearances, confidential, secret and top secret. So the bottom one is confidential and then there is uh, in the middle you have secret and then there is top secret at the top. And you see there are three objects, object A, object B and object C. Object A is at top secret level, object B is at secret level and object C is at the confidential level. Now if subject Alfred is cleared for secret level, so he can access object B as well as object C. But if he tries to access or read object a he will not be given access to so this is called the simple property which means that the person or the subject is cleared for a certain level he shouldn't have access to anything higher than his level he can have access to anything at at his level and lower to that level so then if you see the second one is uh, there which is the star property star property means that he can write to the levels which are at a higher confidentiality level but he cannot write to the uh, to the to the uh, objects at a lower lower uh, confidentiality level uh, okay so this is for writing this is called the star property what is this and why this generally people get confused with this why somebody can cannot read up but they can uh, write uh, write up but they cannot they can read down but they cannot write down what's the purpose for that uh, generally the simple star property is called no read up and the star property is called no write down. So no read up means you cannot read a higher uh, sub confidentiality level than your one and uh, the no write down means you cannot write to the things which are at a lower confidentiality level. The purpose for that is because this is generally implemented in the military levels. So the people with the higher knowledge, they should not be writing anything on a lower level because this way they can disclose some information. For example, if the if the subject here is Alfred and he is, let's suppose he's a captain in the in the in the army and he tries to read something from a higher level he will not be given access to but he can feed information to the higher ranks so that he will be, he will be allowed to write up so the people at the higher level they can read information which he has given them but he should not be able to write anything down because if he writes something at a lower level which is object c so he can disclose some information so which is why he will not be given access to write anything under that. So which is why no read up, no write down. So these are the two properties of the Bella Pajola model. And in the strong star property, the persons are confined with, with their level only. So they can read and write on their level only, but they cannot read or write anything above or lower than their levels. So this is the uh, Bella Pajola model. Okay, second, uh, so the, these are the few limitations for the Bella Pajula security model. So it has these two limitations. One is the, it is related with the confidentiality only. It does not cover the availability as well as the integrity of the data. It is only for confidentiality. And there is no method for management of classifications because it understands or it assumes that the classification is already done and the classification is complete and there is nothing which is outside the classification. All data, all subjects, all objects, they are all classified and then only it will work. If you do not have any proper classification, your Bella Pajula model is not gonna work in that way. Uh, now we'll we'll move to the second model, which is the BIBA. Before that, let's talk about these rules. So there are four rules of integrity. As we mentioned, integrity means that the things are changed in a control way. There is no change made to the to any object or any system or any piece of information without proper authorization. So uh, for that way, we have these four rules of integrity. Uh, 
Number one, the first rule is the data is protected from modifications by an authorized user. So if somebody is not authorized, he should not be able to make any change to the system. The second is the data is protected from unauthorized modification by authorized users. So if the person is authorized, but he is trying to put some data which is not proper, so he will be stopped from that. So that is the second rule of integrity. The third rule is the data is internally and externally consistent. So the data consistency is ensured whether you see it from inside or from outside the uh, perspective of the data and the fourth property of the uh, of fourth rule of integrity is that the data held in a database must balance internally and externally to the external real world situation so the data should reflect the real world situation so these are four rules of integrity and why I, I put this here just to uh, to highlight the things that we are going to see in the next slides so the second model is the BBAS security integrity model. So as its name shows, it is related for the integrity. As we talked about earlier, Bella Pajula was mainly for the uh, for the confidentiality and BBA model is only for integrity. So it, it addresses the integrity in the information systems, which is based on the hierarchy, hierarchical uh, lattice of integrity levels. It has a question. Uh, the question from Adnan is can save it. I don't get the question. We will have, we'll, can you please elaborate question Adnan or we will have questions in the end. Okay, so it, in, in this also we will have set of subjects and set of objects and integrity means so the prevent unauthorized subjects from modifying objects. So uh, it, it covers only the first rule of integrity. So this is how we can describe the Viva model. We'll see it in the picture. So there are three conditions here. So there is simple integrity condition, then there is integrity star property and invocation property. So the simple integrity means subjects cannot read objects of lesser integrity. Now here, please, whenever you are seeing the pictures, don't see that they are the levels of confidentiality, they are levels of integrity. So if there is one level of integrity, then there is higher level of integrity and so on. So if you are cleared for a certain level of integrity, you cannot read objects of lesser integrity. And similarly, the subject cannot write to the objects of higher integrity. So in the, in the first one here, we'll see that no read down and no write up. In the previous model, we saw no read up and no write down. Here is the reverse one. So no read up and no write down. You cannot read of uh, any object of higher integrity, of lesser integrity, and you cannot write to any object of higher integrity. And invocation property is the third one. Subject cannot send messages or logical requests of service to object of higher integrity. So these are three, three rules of PBA model. So this is the illustration of this. So if you see here, these are three integrity levels, low, medium, and high. Okay, and uh, there are three objects at these three levels, object A, object B, and object C. And the same subject, uh, Alfred, who is cleared for secret level, he tries to access the data. Now, if he is reading some information from integrity level of uh, A, um, high and medium, he will be given access to, but if he tries to like, read something from the lower integrity level, he will not be given access to. Similarly, when he tries to write something, he will not be given access to object A, and but he can uh, write to object level B and object C. So it means, uh, no read down and no write up here. Example for this can be given like this, that for integrity point of view, that let's suppose there are two people who are writing two different reports. One person is writing a report for uh, like the ideas of the people and the other person is writing a report to the CEO for the next uh, marketing strategy of the company. Now the person who is getting the ideas, he is getting information from everywhere. So he is getting information from people who have like their brainstorming sessions and uh, the ideas from people. So he's collecting all of that and making them as a complete uh, what, whatever was uh, discussed in all the meetings. Some of those ideas will be practical and some of them may not be practical. Now, if the other person is writing a report to the CEO and with the proper uh, set 
pro proper uh, uh, marketing plan of the company if he also reads that information which the first person has prepared so he might get some information from there which can put in the report and but that is not the proper integrity the integrity of that data is not uh, uh, not assured so which is why that information will not be suitable to be written in the report which is going to be sent to the ceo so which is why this person will not have any access to the data so he will not read anything on a lesser integrity so he will not have access to to read this but the same person can feed the data which is going to be in the first person's report so he can give his ideas to the first person when he is doing he is recording all the sessions and all the brainstorming information from all the people so this way you can see the difference so that the second person because he is dealing with the higher highly integrated data so he will not have access to the low integrity data this is just an example so the third model that we are looking at is the Clark Wilson model. So it was created in 1987. This was the first commercial model. So, so far what we have seen, Biva as well as the Bella Majula, they were mainly for the military and the governments. But this was the first commercial model, which is why here we are talking about the users and files and folders, etc. So it dictates that the suppression of duties must be enforced and subject must access data through an application only which means the object should not be given direct access. So as you can see in the picture, subject when he tries to access the object directly, he's denied access, but when he goes through the program or application, he is given access to. And the last part is auditing is required. So this was the first commercial model, which is implemented. And the, based on this, different operating systems have been made. And this was the first thing. So it has called access control triple. So there are three things. So first one is uh, there are users. So users are the ones which are the uh, general people who are accessing the system. Then there are transformation procedures. So they are the request, whether read or write or something, whatever is the request. Those are called the transformation procedures. And then you have the constrained data item and unconstrained data items which are being accessed. So when the user is trying to access, so he will be going through, he will be sending some uh, right, he is sending, for example, he's sending a read, inf read request or write exit request or update request or delete request or whatever is the request that, so that will be the TP or the transmission procedure. And then if it is controlled through the TP, it is called the constrained data item. If it is not controlled through the TPs, it is called the unconstrained data item. And then there is the integrity verification procedures, which ensures that the data is integral before and after any transmission procedures are run on that particular data so the, it ensures that the data is uh, properly verified the data is integrate in, integral of before and after the access whatever was done so this all is made sure through well-formed transaction so well-formed transaction is uh, is implementing all of these things which we saw in the first thing in the first part so it ensures that the data item is well in a valid state it deserves or ensures internal consistency. It manipulates data only in ways that ensure internal consistency. So uh, this is how the implementation of the Clark Wilson model is done in the commercial environment. So another model is the non-interference non model. So also known as the Gorgon Massiger security model. So it is loosely based on the information flow model. So it focuses on how the actions of a subject at a higher sensitivity level affect the system state or action of a subject at a lower sensitivity level, etc. So which means the interference. So if the uh, the subjects at a higher sensitivity level, they, have, they will have no interference with the subjects or of a lower, in, no, low, lower interference, lower uh, sensitivity level and vice versa. So the purpose for that is that the people or the subjects, they stay at a certain uh, sensitivity level and they do not interfere with each other. So this way the information is not shared and not leaked from one place to the other. So another model is the uh, Brewer and Nash security model, which is also called the Chinese wall model. So in this, what happens is to ensure that there is no conflict of interest. So if one person is handling data of one company and he uh, he will not be given access of the same kind of information of another company to ensure that there is no conflict of interest. For example, if you are working in the stock exchange and you are also handling the information of a company who has who is trading in the stock exchange, so you might get some inside information of the company and based on that you can influence the trade of that company's shares. For example, if you see that the financial statement of a company is going to be sent to the market and 
just before that market the information is going to be sent to the market and you know about that and you know the content of that financial statement you can say you can ask people who are your customers to either uh, buy or sell the shares of that company because after the financial statement releases you you can see the prices of the share are going to be higher or at a, or increase or decrease based on that so this way what what happens is that you will have a, a, a chinese wall kind of a thing there is a virtual wall which ensures that any system who has access to one kind of information from one system uh, they should not have access of the similar system or similar kind of information of the other system to ensure that the data is not interchanged with each other and uh, there is another model called the graham denning security model it's a very simple and security there are eight controls and based on these eight controls you will see you will they are implemented so they are basically to how to create uh, security create object subject security de securely delete and uh, a subject and object how to provide read access to the uh, to the uh, to the object and how to grant uh, how to grant access how to delete access and how to transfer access so these are the uh, uh, security rules so once you put those rules uh, in, in place this particular model is implemented these were these were a few fundamental uh, security models you will not see any of those models physically present anywhere they are only the reference models they are used to uh, just provide the outline of a reference and based on those references many different kind of operating systems and applications are developed and then they implement them so the next in the next objective is to select the controls based upon the uh, system security requirements now we'll see how different controls are done so before we go into that uh, we have to see first of all something that is called the uh, systems evaluation uh, but you when you are uh, you are when you have any systems that you have for example you have operating systems like windows or unix or linux etc so first of all they have to be evaluated so that system evaluation is done so what is system evaluation it's an assurance evaluation uh, it examine the security relevant parts of the system for example the tcb or access control mechanisms or reference monitor or kernel or protection mechanisms so the relationship and interaction between these components are also evaluated in order to determine the level of protection required to uh, um, required and provided by the system so historically so there were uh, different methods of evaluation and assigning assurance levels to the system uh, like you could you might have heard about the tcsec or itsec or these kinds of systems but lately uh, a common criteria was developed to, so there is only one frame one framework uh, which is known as common criteria so which is a mi mixture of all of them so this is how the common criteria was developed so common criteria is a framework uh, within which users specify their security requirements and vendors make claims about uh, how they satisfy those requirements and independent labs can verify those claims so uh, this is how the common criteria works so uh, as a as an end system you can say that i want an operating system which meets with these particular requirements and then they will uh, the, system, the the vendors will provide this uh, so within the common criteria we have these elements so there is the protection profile so it's a specific fundamental and assurance requirements and it applies to the category of products uh, not just a single one so the protection profile is the set of rules which the user or the customer he wants in his particular uh, system so he will define all his requirements part of the protection profile so then the target of evaluation is the application or the operating system which is going to be evaluated so the, so this is the specific product or system that is going to be evaluated and then there is security target written by the vendor or developer to explain functional and assurance specification of the product and how they meet these common criteria requirements so the vendor will develop this security target and in the end when the evaluation is done at the end you will be given uh, evaluation assurance level or eal so these are different different eal levels which are assigned to that depending on the uh, uh, the the conformance of uh, the security target so their combined rating of functional and assurance evaluation so these are different evaluation levels so for example you will say that uh, if, if some system is given eal 0 in that there is no in a, no assurance is there 
it's inadequate ratio. So this is the lowest level. And the highest level is the formally verified, designed and tested. So in between you will see AL1, AL2, AL3, 4, 5, 6 and 7. Generally AL4 is a very accepted norm. Uh, if your system or your application or operating system meets AL4, it is a very uh, functional and it's uh, practical and it can be trusted. So generally you will see that the applications or operating systems required by a system by a certain entity. So they will say that we want to have a system which is uh, which is cleared at EL level four or five or whatever they require for that. So now we see two different concepts. One is the certification and the other is accreditation. So just like in the previous slide, we saw different EA levels. So once you pass certain EA level, you get certified for that level. So that is called the certification. So certification is a comprehensive evaluation of a technical and non-technical security features of any information system. So it's a comprehensive evaluation. At the end of that, you will get the certification from the uh, different kind of uh, evaluators and then there is another concept called the accreditation 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 means it's the accreditation means it's the uh, management's requirement or management's decision to operate a system so they will decide that okay while we wait for the certification we are we can still go ahead with this particular system while we see that uh, certain system does not meet our requirements but we are going ahead with that so that is called the accreditation so in that accreditation the the company's uh, uh, management so they they will officially uh, agree to use the particular system in a specific environment both certification and accreditation they are for uh, a certain period of time because the the requirements uh, and threats may change over the period of time so if you have a certain certification level today this might increase or decrease depending on the market and the trends at that at that particular time generally it decreases not increases so you can always say that uh, the company might say that we are giving we are accredit accreditating this particular system for 3 months only and after that we have to look for an alternative so they are they are both for a limited period of time only so now we'll see some concepts here uh, like memory protection and TPM module. So first of all, let's talk about the uh, security capabilities. So now here we will talk about only a few terms and how they are, how they relate to the real world. So first of all, let's talk about the uh, access control mechanisms. Access control mechanism, as its name says, it ensures that the access to the objects is properly managed. So methods to distinguish between subjects and objects in a trusted computing system is all managed by this. It involves the use of a reference monitor within the trusted computing base, medi medi mediating all access against the security policy. So it ensures that the, uh, the data is properly managed. So when the access is provided to a certain on a certain object for a certain subject, so the access is properly controlled with that. Then there is secure memory management as we saw earlier. So memory management is one of the key things. So the memory has to be managed properly. The writing to the memory, reading from the memory and storing the data in the for the long term retention, they have to be all securely managed within that. Uh, another concept is the processor state so processors can be running either in the you can have processes which are running either in the supervisor or kernel mode or you can have the processes which are running in the uh, problem state or the user mode so if you are uh, you have a process which process which is running it in the uh, kernel mode it has access to the hardware without any uh, limitation and also without any uh, specific uh, uh, specific delay or uh, restriction whereas if you're running in the user mode so whenever you are going to access the data from the kernel mode so it has you have to go through a certain process so the uh, limit is there the so user mode applications they do not have direct access to the hardware it's only they can run through the given DLLs or given drivers another concept is layering so in layering so Security can be enhanced by the separation of the various interactions between the privileged entities in the operating system. The example of this to use the ring systems. So you create the layers and you can say that people or the processes or the things at a certain, la a certain layer or a certain ring. So they have, uh, then the, you define access for that particular layer. And then with that you define, you assign layers to your system, to your subjects and objects in the system and accordingly you give access to that. 
And another concept is the process isolation. So it means that the processes are isolated. They do, they do not interact with each other. If one process has uh, some access to the data or information, this access is not mixed with the other process and each process has its own registers, its, its own memory area, its own process area and those process areas are not mixed with the other one. So the next concept is data hiding. So data hiding is a software development technique specifically used in the object oriented, or object -oriented programming. Uh, it's to hide internal object details, for example, the data members. So data hiding ensures that exclusive data access to class members and uh, protects objects integrity by uh, preventing un uh, unintended or intended changes. Uh, so another concept is the uh, abstraction. So abstraction means you by removing the characteristics of an uh, entity to simplify its representation. For example, creating the groups rather than assigning permissions to the users directly. So that's where you that's how you abstract your uh, system. Another concept is the cryptographic protections. So cryptography is uh, in, in our next session. We'll, we'll talk in detail what are cryptography. So cryptography is covered. Uh, so its purpose is to ensure that the data which is written is accessed only to the people who have a, who have key for reading that data. And then the next concept is the host-based firewalls. So firewalls which are running on a single host to ensure that any data which is uh, uh, received and sent from this particular host is uh, it, it goes through specific security policy. And uh, if the policy is uh, allowing it, only then the data is allowed. Otherwise, the data is not allowed. So another capability is uh, concept is the audit and monitoring controls. So you have to ensure that whenever you have a system, it has specific audit and monitoring controls. So audit means that the things which are performed on the system, they are all logged. And at any time, if you want to go back and see what happened at what time, what was done by home. So you can go ahead and do that by seeing the audit logs. Similarly, you can do the monitoring. You can have real time monitoring or you can go and store everything in the log and go back and see that in whenever you want to see that. So you can have implemented this by uh, using the same solution or host-based ideas or network-based ideas solutions. So the concept is the virtualization. So the virtualization is a concept by which you use the same hardware for running multiple operating systems. All of them, they run in the virtual environments and virtually they will have access to all the resources, but physically they are all controlled by the, uh, by the hypervisor on which these virtual machines are running. So the hypervisor has access to all the hardware, but the virtual machines, they will, they will be fooled by the hypervisor that they have access to the hardware, but in, in actual, they will, they will not have any access to the hardware. Our last topic for today is the, is these things. So we'll see different systems and how uh, we can see the vulnerabilities on those systems and how we are going to, uh, to ensure that they are properly managed or they are properly secured. <clears throat> so vulnerabilities could be for any of these reasons. So you can have either one of the vulnerabilities is poor memory management. So by that you will have uh, memory is pro not properly managed. So you will have many issues of the uh, uh, property man memory management your system may be unstable because of that. So if you are not writing the information properly or you are not isolating, isolating the processes properly, you will have these memory management issues. The other issue could be the cover channel. So the cover channel is a way for an entity to receive information in an authorized, unauthorized manner. So these communications can be very difficult to detect. Cover channels are of two types. So they can be storage or uh, timing. In a covered storage channel, the processes are enabled to communicate uh, through some types of storage space on the system. So, and also the, in the covered timing channel, one process relays information to another by uh, modulating its use of uh, system resources. So other issue could be the insufficient resiliency or redundancy. So if you do not have proper resiliency, your system can be uh, unavailable because of something. For example, if you do not have proper redundancy in the disks or in the power, if the power is out, if you do not have, if your power supply is gone, uh, your system may be down. But if you have dual power supply, so it means if one power supply is down, you're still 
working with that. Similarly, your power sources are there for the disks you might have, you, can, you have to implement different rate levels, etc. And the last issue could be your access control. If you do not have proper implementation of access control mechanisms, you can have unstable environment. So they could be from the poor design or poor implementation or the lack of knowledge of the person who is implementing that. So let's see the different systems and how uh, they are vulnerable and how we can secure them. First of all, let's talk about the web-based systems. Generally, the web-based systems are the biggest uh, source of attacks. So they are facing the internet, so they are very easily accessible, which is why the, many attackers, they start any attacks through the web-based web systems. If you have a system which is in your environment, only internal people can access that, so they are not uh, prone to the higher number of attacks. Whereas if you have a system which is facing the internet, it, it can uh, receive requests from people who are who have very malicious intent for, for that purpose. So for that, you have to ensure that all the web-based systems, they are properly secured. You have to implement uh, the encryption. So you use HTTPS or SSL. Um, like the TLS 1.2, for example, is the accepted norm now. If you are running SSL 3, it is not safe, it is not secure. Uh, similarly, you have to ensure that all the communications to the internal systems, they are going through the firewalls. So your system should not have direct access to the internal systems. So in case your web application or the web system is compromised, it should not and it should not mean that your internal data is also not secure, which is why you will always implement a DMZ. In the DMZ, you will put your web system in the DMZ and the internal system where your databases, etc., are hosted. They are stored inside your network and they will not have access to that environment. So another uh, uh, approach is to implement WAFs or web, applic web, applica web application firewalls. So they will ensure that not only the traffic is secure but also the state of your application is also maintained and it is always secure mobile systems are uh, one of the uh, most used systems now you almost every person in the planet has their mobile devices one way or another they have access to the internet through the mobile devices but uh, people do not generally give that much of attention to that as a company you should always give the same level of uh, uh, of importance to the mobile devices as you are giving to your normal computers or laptops. So uh, you should implement your, bring your own device policy, BYOD. So BYOD policies are very norm these days in the company where you are uh, controlling how the device is managed by the people. If when they connect them to the corporate network, uh, what will be the behavior? You can implement containerization, you can implement the process isolation, you can implement many different kind of security mechanisms. So they should be, implemented to ensure that the proper security is implemented on the uh, on all the mobile devices also so these are a few uh, issues which can be there and then uh, they, they should always be addressed whenever you are implementing any mobile system security policy within the company so these are a few uh, uh, points that you should follow you can follow to ensure that the uh, the uh, mobile systems are properly secured for example, you can say that the centralized management has to be there. For example, Microsoft mobile device management or Microsoft Intune can be used to have access to the mobile devices and to control the uh, policy of the usage of the mobile devices. Remote policies should be pushed to each device and ensure that there is properly data encryption and there are proper locks, screen saver, etc. are there. Uh, Bluetooth is one of the issues. So Bluetooth can uh, leak some information. So you should ensure that Bluetooth capabilities are locked down. So Bluetooth, Bluetooth is disabled unless it's used. If it is used, then it has to be done in a secure way. So endpoint security should be expanded to the mobile endpoints also. So as you are going to implement any security for your normal endpoints, so mobile devices should also be treated the same way. So then there are embedded systems. Uh, embedded systems are the small systems with embedded hardware and software together. For example, your in this, these days, very small firmware are needed for that. For example, you have uh, your home devices, wash, washing machine, your uh, 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 shavers, uh, or even the uh, air conditioners, etc. So, or the smart TVs. So they are all embedded systems. So they, they you have to ensure that the security is properly pro provided there. Now, we are seeing that a lot of uh, 
uh, companies are uh, giving the things, uh, giving the access to those embedded systems, and uh, because of that, the, the security has to be implemented. So one of the easiest ways is not to connect them to the internet. Uh, so that way the uh, exposure factor is reduced. So this exposure is uh, reduced because of that your systems can stay safer. Uh, at the same time, from a security perspective, there are many disadvantages and advantages, both of them. So when you have, you have a, a, an embedded system, generally they are very small, then they have very small footprint and they have very small storage also, and they run very small uh, operating systems part also, which is why you, they do not have a lot of uh, issues as well as the problem is that it's very hard to patch at that time. And the next thing is the internet, internet of things. It's also on boom. So now you are connecting all your devices to the internet, your uh, home security controls, your lighting controls, your air conditioning, cooling, etc. You connect them to the internet and they are controlled by the people, by you or by your authorized people as a as, as an outsourced environment. So with that, you manage all of those things which you are interacting with on a daily basis. Uh, so they are all controlled through the internet. So you can have your security system connected to the internet and when you are anywhere, it will give you the alarm whenever there is any intruder accessing your house, etc. Or before you reach home, you can switch on your air conditioning or by the night, automatically the lights are turned on and uh, by the morning they are turned off, etc. The issues with the IoT are generally the authentication, how the access to the devices is maintained, encryption of data. So when your data is transferring over the internet, nobody else should be able to uh, to it, uh, intercept it and uh, get some meaning on that and it has to also get the updates with the latest trends in the security and the last part is the industrial control systems so industrial control systems they are used generally on the in the industries so they are used to ensure that the uh, industrial systems are maintained and managed properly so you, you have different kinds of uh, uh, systems which are running so generally there is uh, NIST publication SP 800-82 which is a guide to the industrial control system security uh, this is a very good reference so you can refer to that for implementing security for that so ICS can be categorized into these three systems uh, programmable logical controllers or uh, distributed control systems or SCADA uh, you can just search for them and you can get some more information about these and how they are implemented and uh, to implement a proper security of the ICS uh, so you have to ensure that there is a proper risk management done. You segment the network of the IDS and IPS uh, in the different subnets and disable the unneeded ports, implement least privileges, use encryption and ensure that there is a process for patch management and finally there is monitor the logs. So that concludes our session today guys and uh, I hope it was uh, meaningful. I don't think we can get questions here for any questions please refer to the youtube channel and or you can send me directly on the group or on the on my uh, on my link that i have provided you for the linkedin thank you very much for joining up and uh, have a good day thank you